Bridging Gaps, the business podcast with Deborah Levitt, sharing the challenges and stories of fellow business owners. Hi, um, my name is Deborah Levitt, and I'm here today with Anne Renshaw for the first episode in my new podcast, Bridging Gaps, the business podcast. So, Anne, hello, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Great to be here. I'm really pleased to have you on. I'm really looking forward to to talking to you some more. Um, So Anne is from a company called Flam Rouge. And Anne, perhaps you can explain just a little bit about why the company is called Flam Rouge and what it is that you do. Um, Yes, so I do strategic marketing and business development for professional services companies. I've got a history of doing it um, and set up on my own doing it last year um, just to be able to go out and help some smaller firms like smaller accountants and solicitors and architects be able to compete with some of the bigger firms out there, smaller firms that might not be able to have their own in-house capability because they haven't actually got uh, the funds to be able to support somebody full time. Um, and how it was called Flam Rouge, uh, when I decided to set the business up, I had no idea what to call it, despite being in marketing, um, and was brainstorming with my friend Tom, and he just said, write all the things down that are in your head at this moment, and I wrote lots of things down, um, and it was during the Tour de France, and I'd written the words Flam Rouge down, and Tom said, right, I really like that, what does it mean? <laughs> Flam Rouge, when you're on a stage of something like the Tour de France, a kilometre from the end, there's a big kind of arc that goes over over the race um, and it signals the last kilometre of the race. So it signals the fact that you've nearly got to the finish. It's time to give it one last push. It kind of signifies the end of where all the teamwork finishes and then people just kind of make a dash to the finish. So for me, it was really appropriate because a lot of what I do is based around teamwork. It's about helping uh, people within the businesses be the best of themselves through teamwork and achieving things through marketing and business development and effectively helping them achieve their flam rouge, whatever that might be. Excellent. And how do you help them? What sort of things do you do to actually help them to take those steps and actually put their marketing you know, strategy in place? Um, it varies. I've done so many different projects with different firms. Um, so from going into a firm at that has quite a good idea about where their marketing is going, but they're not quite sure why they're not bringing leads in. And I can kind of do a bit of a, a review on what their business development processes are, whether their team need a bit of upskilling in terms of networking training or business development sales training, look at their pitch documents, presentations, and give them advice on that. Um, but then there's also firms that I've worked with that are, they know that they're growing um, They're not quite sure why they're growing. They want to achieve more growth in the coming years. And so they need a bit of help on establishing who their kind of key audiences are, really what their USP is and what they're going to take out to these audiences. Um, What service lines are the most profitable? What kind of client base is the most profitable? Um, So that they can then move forward with a kind of a really good idea how to communicate to that market and what the best way of marketing is Um, and for a lot of professional services firms they don't have huge budgets to be able to spend on marketing so it's working out what they can do um, that doesn't take a lot of investment such as key referrer networks um, where they can just kind of work out relationships move them forward and it doesn't take a lot of uh, resource in terms of money it's just more their time and effort in focusing on building those and moving them forward okay thank you so what sort of, you know, so what is a key referral network? What sort of thing does that, you know, so for somebody who's maybe starting out in business and is looking for some marketing, is looking at how to get out there, what sorts of things should they be looking at? And is a key referral something they should know what that is and have, or should they be taking different approaches? I think to a certain extent, referrers can work for any business. It's particularly important in professional services because a lot of work comes from referrers and it's a really um, good channel to be able to convert them quite quickly because they're already warm and to have a higher conversion rate. Um, I would say that a lot of people tend to have a lot of referrers in their network. So say a firm of solicitors may have lots of accountants that they give work to. They may have lots of banks that they give work to. They might have lots of uh, wealth managers or independent financial advisors. Um, And a lot of people can think, well, I'm giving out all of these referrals. So they may have 15 
uh, accountants that they give one job to each time and then 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 not they don't understand why they don't get a lot of referrals back and it's probably because they're giving one referral to each of these people and there may be other firms of solicitors that are giving more than that to them so they then don't reciprocate because they're not high up on on the kind of chart or the agenda of these firms so what I always suggest to people is that they go through a bit of a process of looking at the people they do have referral relationships with working out where the real opportunities lie whether there are people with a really great client bank or whether where there are people that they really get on with um, and then actually kind of bringing this down to three or four key relationships that if they give them five referrals instead of the one they're more likely to get them back because they've given a, a decent amount and also part of having referrer relationships is really getting to know these people having lines of communication so that it's as easy as possible for them to refer to you and indeed for you to refer to them so that they then reciprocate and you can't do it with lots of referrers it's much easier just to have a small number of referrers that you can really get to know well um, and then the referrals will start flowing through. So it's really about building a strong relationship with a, a select group of people that you, you think it's going to be mutually beneficial. Absolutely. And it doesn't necessarily need to be professionals. Um, there are people in kind of construction that I know where, and in fact, in many, many different uh, businesses where if there's somebody that's in your network that you know is a really good ambassador for you, um, and is the kind of person that has people in their network that can refer people to you. It's just picking those kind of people out as well. So it do, it's not necessarily just limited to professional services. It could be any industry. Okay. And what about networking? Because I know when I started going networking, I found it really daunting. And I still find it quite off-putting to walk into a room of strangers on some occasions where you know everybody seems to already be happily chatting and things like that what, what kind of things do you recommend to people you know if they are starting getting out and they, they you know so I know from my experience and also from other people I've spoken to that quite often the feeling is oh I can't do that or I wouldn't be any good at that or I don't like it and, and so how what would you suggest that, that we do to overcome those sorts of things um, I think the key thing for me is to remember at all times that probably 90% of the people in that room are feeling exactly the same way as you do. Um, a lot of people feel quite um, worried about networking. They're not easy networkers, particularly business owners that are very good at what they do, uh, but they're not necessarily great at relationships and just walking into a room full of people. There's quite a lot of pressure on that. Um, so yes, A, I would say, bear in mind that lots of people are in that position. Sometimes you can walk into that room feeling I'm the only person that feels this way and you're absolutely not. Um, I do a lot of networking, but I still get very nervous when I go into rooms. So I have what I call my little networking persona called Confident Anne. Um, and I get to the door sometimes feeling very nervous, but I become <laughs> Confident Anne. And I walk into the room and I put a big smile on my face. Um, and for the first five minutes, I just kind of, force myself to go in and talk to people, force myself to look like this confident person. And once you've got over the first five minutes, you'll become that person anyway. And you'll suddenly realise that it's really not that bad and that everybody is really lovely and that it will be a great experience. And, and do you have any tips or, or, I don't know, kind of stock questions or conversation starters or anything that you would say, okay, if it all goes quiet, I know how I'm going to, to get this conversation moving? Um, in the first instance, to get over kind of having to go into big groups of people, I would say just my one tip is to go to a networking event early because it's so much easier to get there when there's only a few people, kind of two or three people already there. Um, because then as people come in, you'll naturally be introduced to people and it's so much easier than walking into a room full of people where there's already conversations in flow. Um, and in terms of just asking questions make sure that they there's no kind of stop question but make sure it's questions that you're actually interested in about that person so if you start saying to them well what do you think of the state of the economy and you're not really interested in the state of the economy it's going to show um 
So actually, if there's nothing wrong with saying to somebody, you know, how's your year been so far in business? Or have you got any holidays planned? Lots of people want to speak about themselves and to, to talk to people about themselves um, is the easiest thing you can do. And really, if you're the kind of person that finds it quite easy just to talk to people about not necessarily the nitty gritty of their business, but stuff to do with them as well, then actually that's quite a good place to start. Because you don't need to know what industry they're in. You don't need to know where they are in the, in the position, in the company that they're in. Just showing an interest in them as a person is, is just as good a thing to do. Excellent. So that leads quite nicely into talking about people. And how did you, so you've been, I think it's coming up for about 18 months now that you've been running Flam Rouge? Yes, indeed. How did you find it when you first started? So you came from, I think, a corporate background. And yeah. you get into being, you know, essentially self-employed as many business owners, in, you know, including myself are. Um, how did you find that transition and that move from, from you know, big companies to, to being yourself? Um, wow. There are so many different things that I've experienced. Um, firstly, being a, owning your own business is just amazing in many, many ways. Um, every time you win a new client, you just it's you and you're just so joyful that somebody has picked you and trusted you with their business and has trusted you to be able to help them take their business forward and that's a fantastic aspect of it and even now when I win a new client it's just a feeling like no other really. Um, I think what I hadn't fully thought about is the fact that I'm quite a people person um, there are some days, some days I go and work with clients on their premises and that's amazing and I love being part of their team, but there are other days that I'm working from home and actually it can get quite lonely and I miss those kind of water cooler move, uh, moments where you can just have a chat with somebody about what you watched on telly last night or what they're doing for their holiday or anything like that really. Um, so I think the people side of things I miss the most um, just having a team around me, but then I've learned that just I can still do that. Um, I've got a group of friends um, that I used to go to a networking event with who are really close friends now. Um, and I know that at any point I could pick up the phone to any one of them or just send them a message um, and they'd be able to help. They'd be able to just chat inanely with me about something. Um, and also I've just found a co-working space where I'm going to be based out of um, kind of a day or day and a half a week. Uh, which has made a big difference and I've already made lots of friends there so going there kind of feels like going to an office so I would say that anybody that was thinking about starting up their own business to build up a network um, of people around you that you can at least call or message is really important because it can be quite lonely um, as a business owner. Yeah, and I think I know that's something that I've come across quite a lot as well, you know, not just for, for myself, but with others that that feeling of isolation. And as you say, you can be sat, yeah. you know, in your home, which in some ways is fantastic. But, you know, sometimes you do just want that interaction and being able to know that there are people that you can meet up with or go and work somewhere really does make a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. So what about, you know, if you were looking back when you first started out, what would you say, you know, sort of were, you know, apart from discovering that isolation and, and that, that, you know, desire to make sure that you did have people around you when it, when it suits you, what were the other challenges or, or sort of maybe the key challenges that you would advise somebody starting up now to, to really try and take into account before they go too far down the road of, of starting their own business? Um, I think it's to get into a routine of um, work in terms of, to begin with, I was very much focused on, I needed to be doing something on the business at all times and I needed to be busy and it didn't really matter what I was doing. As long as I was busy, I felt like I was doing something on the business, but then that led me to be too busy. Um, I would just fill my time. I'd get up at six o'clock in the morning and I'd start working straight away um, I'd get to about two o'clock in the afternoon and I'd realize I was still sitting here in my pajamas um, I hadn't actually eaten anything or done anything and just busily type away at whatever it was that I was doing and then I'd finish at kind of seven eight o'clock at night so I think it's been very clear on what the priorities are and what is going to make the biggest difference to your business and kind of being very especially in the first stages planning well on what is going to make a difference to your business, what you really need to get done. 
um, and being honest with yourself about what you really need to get done because a lot of the time I would tell myself that I really really needed to do my receipts in receipt bank and I needed to do them that day rather than do something that perhaps wasn't you know it was that eat the frog moment and I didn't want to do it but of course my receipt seemed really important to me at that point so it is being honest with yourself and identifying what it is that you really need to do that's going to move your business forward in those first few months. Excellent and just thinking about um, you personally I know that you spend a lot of time well one run a triathlon recently and also you do quite a bit for charity and I just wondered if you wanted to talk because I know those two tie together quite well if you want to talk a little bit about that and and I guess how you find it how it fits with your business life what it gives you just generally yeah um so yes I did my first triathlon for disability challenges down in Guildford um in 2011 it was just a very short one um and absolutely loved kind of being part of their community, being able to help. They've got an amazing facility down there helping disabled children and their families. They're just a brilliant place to go and experience. And I know that they're a lifeline for the children and, and their families. Um, and so I've tried to do something kind of every year or every other year since then. And particularly as Flam Rouge, I've got involved in their business club, which is fantastic meet lots of other local businesses who are just as passionate about the charity and fundraising and making a difference in their community um, as I am. Because I've, I've always thought that for me being in business, it's not just about the money. If it was about the money, I'd go back and work in London, earning a lot more than I do um, as my business. Um, but it's about being able to do something with what I love doing as a business and to be able to make a difference to other people. So this year I'm doing um, another triathlon later in the year, which is an iron distance triathlon, but over three days, which will be a bit easier. Um, and for me, it's great because it also adds um, something to my day that I need to exercise and actually making the time to exercise during my day gives me that kind of clarity of thought. It's quite often that you'll be sitting kind of doing work and you'll think, no, no, I don't have time to do any exercise. But on those days, actually, if you don't exercise, they're often the days where you, by two o'clock in the afternoon, your brain will be just completely fried. So actually making the time um, to take that time out and go and do some exercise really does help with a me physically and, and mentally. But it also just really helps with my workload and it helps me kind of get some space and, and come back to what I'm doing, thinking a lot clearer. And then I think that's. Um, really important for people is to have that time where you you do just stop and I was away recently and I know there was a point where I was just sitting in a cafe and theoretically I was reading and then I realized that I wasn't reading at all I was actually just completely in the moment watching the world go by I was right by a beach there was lots of activity happening and it was just really nice to just be there and to not feel that I had to do something um, and so having something whether it's just that piece or whether it's going out and you know doing the exercise that you need to do I think it's really important to helping you to stay well healthy in all aspects of it um, absolutely so how how did you take up running tri you know I, I love the way you say oh it's just a little one I'm not <laughs> sure that a little and triathlon really go together <laughs> but how did you <laughs> how did you get to a point of deciding that that was something you were going to do what you know I have a friend who's um, has run for probably as long as I know him but then a few years ago suddenly decided he was going to run the London Marathon and now he seems to run marathons and he's running his third marathon, London marathon, I should say, this coming year. So how did, what, what drove you to deciding to try, you know, a triathlon? Um, for me, it was um, the fact that at one point um, I was 20 stone um, and I decided that I needed to do something about it. I needed to, to kind of turn things around. I didn't like myself very much. And so I started doing a little bit of exercising on a, uh, an exercise bike every day and I started losing weight. Um, and then I actually started doing a little bit of running um, and was doing quite well with the running, but I actually have um, something called hypermobility syndrome, which actually means I really shouldn't be running very much, not as much as I was doing. And I was getting injured a lot and I've had quite a few operations on my feet. 
Um, and I happened to meet a lady who I'm still in touch with now, actually, um, who does triathlons. And she said to me, well, why don't you try a triathlon? Um, because then the running is only one small part of the rest of it. And cycling, um, I had to get an, a, my first proper bike, which was a road bike, which I was scared of falling off constantly. And I went back to swimming, which I used to do when I was younger anyway. But I, le- I found open water swimming, which I now absolutely love. Um, so, yeah, I just, it was something that I, ne- I knew I needed something to keep me fit. Um, I love exercise, but unless I've got a bit of a goal, I don't tend to prioritise it over other things, um, which is why I always try and do kind of one race a year that is my, as they call it, a race. Right. Something to train for and something to get me out of bed in the morning. That's amazing, Anne. I think I've told you that before, that I think you are very amazing. I know you say you're not, but trust me, you are. (laughs) I don't feel it. (laughs) It's okay, I feel it for you. So, (laughs) So, um, just trying to think if there's anything else that, um, that, you know, we've talked a little bit about how you started with Flamme Rouge, um, how you've come with this amazing, you know, running triathlons, well, running, cycling and swimming them, and, and the Challengers charity, which, you know, I remember hearing them speak one day about what they do, and it is absolutely amazing the difference they make in lives. Is there anything, I guess, that you'd like to wrap up on that if you know if you were listening to this yourself that you wish somebody would have I don't know told you this or shared this or um I think for me and I was talking to somebody else about this that's just set up their business it's that it is hard setting up a business and I don't think sometimes you realize how hard it's going to be I used to be a business coach actually and I remember coaching businesses but at that point I had no idea what it was actually like to run a business. I knew the processes behind it, the marketing, the, the kind of operations, and I knew how to coach people into the doing of the business, but I didn't realize the kind of psychology um, and the issues that people faced. Um, and for me, when I first started up, I used to wake up in the mornings and I used to think, oh my God, how am I going to get any more clients? Oh my God, I'm never going to get any more clients. People, are, people aren't going to like me. And then I'd panic about how I was going to pay my rent. And, I'm, and that's just, as a business owner, your brain kind of plays tricks on you. Um, so I learned various different coping mechanisms. I've now got a little mantra that I say to myself in my head whenever I wake up thinking like that. Um, I've got a few client quotes, which it sounds really sad, but I keep them on a piece of paper next to my bed. So that if I do wake up thinking, oh my God, my clients are all going to leave me. I look at these client quotes and I think, no, Anne, you are, you are good at what you do. Um, so it's, it's reminding yourself that the voices in your head, which will, there will be often the doubting voices. Um, they're just there to protect you really. They're there to actually use them, if anything, to give you a bit of a spur um, to go out and to, to kind of plan and to get more clients, to get more business, but allow them to give you a bit of a kick, but don't allow them to kick you in the head and to kick you down. Um, And just, yeah, just surround yourself with people that whenever you are feeling like that, um, you can call them and they can give you a virtual slap down the phone. That That's fantastic, Anne, and thank you. And I, I agree with the, the need to, well, have the people around and to be able to put those voices in their place so where they where they belong whether that's giving you a kick or just telling them to go away because I think it is a big shock um, especially if you've come from a corporate background and you've always you know you've been relatively successful and now suddenly you're out there on your own and there's it's a whole new world yeah especially when you come across a, a problem in your business because when you're in a corporate background you're part of a team you've got people sitting around you I mean I worked in an office where there were a thousand people in the building a hundred people on each floor that was completely open plan so if something came up or if something happened or if something somebody said something to you you could immediately turn to the person next to you and just say gosh can you believe it such and such has just said this and they would say oh they're obviously just having a bad day and you'd think yeah they're right I'm going to move on But when you're sitting at home on your own and somebody says something and it might just be that you've taken it completely the wrong way, um, 
but you sit there and it can go round in your head and it can go round in your head and you can dwell on it. So it is important to kind of make up for the lack of colleagues with just having that support network around you that you can just send them a quick text and go, this is what's just happened. And they can go, yeah, yeah, yeah that happens to me all the time. It's fine. Move on. <laughs> That's really great, Anne. Thank you very much, and thank you for being my very first guest. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much for listening to the first episode of Bridging Gaps, the business podcast. I'll be looking at how to improve the listening experience for you in future episodes, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks with my next interview. You've been listening to Deborah Levitt on Bridging Gaps, the business podcast. 